Now on BBC4 Comedy from a Perrier Award winner. From last year's Edinburgh Festival and wowing them there again as we speak, and with strong language, Dimitri Martin. The unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates said that over 2,000 years ago, and I agree with him. I would just add, man. <laughs> the unexamined life is not worth living, man, because that hits me here. But when you do examine life, can you go too far? How much is too much, man? That's the question I had to ask myself recently. Because in examining my life, I got carried away. You see, some people are passionate about money or power. Other people are into sex or cats. <laughs> While I like three of those things, <laughs> my passion is for something less tangible. I love figuring things out. The process of exploring a possibility to discover something new, that's my passion. That's a simple pleasure I've enjoyed since I was a kid. But recently, things got complicated. That's what I want to talk about tonight. This is a story about what happens when one man's obsessive analytical mind goes too far and turns on itself. My story starts with one little word, if, and one medium-sized person, I. If I, the statement. If implying possibility. I implying Dimitri. Because you see, it's in the if that I seem to have lost and then rediscovered the I. To put it another way, I figured, since I don't have a job, or a girlfriend, um, or much going on back in my flat. Um, <laughs> why not write an entire show about one word, if? But what does that word mean? Where does one find meaning in life? A dictionary. The nerd's Bible. Hello, old friend. This dictionary is American, which means it's probably fat. <laughs> OK, let's look up the word. If has five meanings. These are the five chapters in my story tonight. Let's start at the beginning. If meaning in the event that. OK? A sample sentence always helps. Let's do one. If I eat another brownie, I will have explosive diarrhea. <laughs> or in my case, when I was a child, if I was uncomfortable or insecure, I would escape into my mind. You see, I believe that every person has a lens through which they see the world. Each of us in this room has a unique lens. And that lens determines the meaning of everything you encounter. People, places, experiences, even simple objects. For example, I have a bottle of beer here. This is a bottle of Rolling Rock beer, an American beer that you might find in a bar or the linen closet of a depressed housewife. <laughs> but it's more than that depending upon your lens. An artist might look at this and see something green that's lit from the front and the sides. An ad executive might look at it and see the centerpiece of a billboard. A guy in a fraternity might look at it and then beat up somebody gay or brown. <laughs> My point is, each lens is unique because it's derived from specific experience. I'm no exception. When I was a kid, I'd sit in class in school and I had trouble paying attention. My mind would wander and I needed something to entertain myself, something to bring into class to amuse myself, you know? sneak in my own reading, but it was never anything cool, like uh, muscle flex, <laughs> or sophisticated, like jugs, no. <laughs> you know what I snuck into class? Puzzle books, like this. Mensa presents Mighty Mind Busters. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm sneaking in. I'm hiding this behind my notebook. While other kids are daydreaming about pecs and tits, in my head there was a very different sound. If a crab and a half weigh a pound and a half, but the half crab weighs as much again as the whole crab, what do half the whole crab and the whole of the half crab weigh? Yeah, baby. It hurts so good. I had a pile of these books, obnoxious titles, games for the super intelligent. 
Brain workout. Brain workout four. <laughs> I can't even remember all the titles. I think one of them was, I'm smart. How can I prove it? <laughs> Five. <laughs> and I would toil over these problems. When I got one right, I would be like, yes, I am smart. These other idiots don't know how much the crabs weigh. <laughs> but I do, because I just spent Saturday working it out. <laughs> I matter. See, that was a way to feel validated. As a kid, you have definite problems in front of you with definite answers in the back. You look it up, banana. Yeah, I'm right, definitely, cool. <laughs> I'm better than I was this morning. I progress. Besides, I had a plan. 11 years old, I figured it out. Career, corporate lawyer, done, check, what's for lunch? I just knew where I was headed. Class? Yeah, whatever, teacher. I got my little puzzles. I'm going to do my own thing. A cowboy of academics on the edge. Besides, look, other things may have contributed. I wasn't athletic. I was on the church basketball team. But that was because I was Greek and had legs. <laughs> and ladies, the chicks didn't get what I was about, despite my performance on the math team. Ladies, that's cool squared. <laughs> Sounds even worse now. Whatever the reason, I spent a lot of time as a kid doing these puzzle books. And it came to shape the way I see the world. So now as an adult, I see the world in those terms. For example, to me, a phone number is always a sentence or an equation. Like my friend Becky. Her number is 971-1181, which is 9 minus 7 quantity times 1 equals 11 minus quantity 8 plus 1. If we do a little work, we see her number is just 2 equals 2. That's much simpler. <laughs> or my friend Michael. If you look at the numbers on a telephone, the letters that go with them make this sentence out of his number. O oh, or OK. O, oh, ZK? <laughs> what does it mean? I don't know. He doesn't know, but that's how we start every conversation. Even when I walk down the street, things look a little different. The signs, the letters dance around. It's like It becomes a little puzzle for me. So say mobile, the gas station, becomes limbo. Starbucks becomes racks bust. Car phone warehouse, ah, one sour crap, we. <laughs> and when I meet somebody, if I meet you for the first time, you tell me your name, I spell it, immediately it's spelled in the air. And then I try to rearrange the letters, see if I can get something out of it. Say I meet a girl. Denise Houston, good to meet you, Dimitri. Denise, how do you spell your name? That's what I thought. Denise, are you aware that the letters in your name also spell, she not snide, ow. <laughs> not the coolest way to meet a lady, which unfortunately usually makes Dimitri Martin mired trite man. <laughs> and I get frustrated. And I just want to say, darn it, merit me. <laughs> it's cool, though. I know that someday I'll meet the right lady. I'll rearrange the letters in her name, and it will make trim TNA ride me. <laughs> But I digress. I just feel like there's a parallel world right in front of us that's revealed with a small shift in perspective. Like sometimes when I look at a donut, it looks like a zero. It's like it's saying, this is how many of me you should eat. <laughs> but then other times I see a bunch of donuts in a row, and it looks like it says, ooh, <laughs> eat all of us. Then I do, and there's one left, and it says, oh. <laughs> Not cool, fatty. I don't own a poncho. I don't have a poncho. But if somebody says to me, do you have a poncho? I don't say no. I say, not right now. Because I do have a blanket and scissors. <laughs> At any moment, I am four minutes from a poncho. <laughs> if you wait here, I will be back with a serape made out of a comforter in four minutes. Even this bottle of beer, this simple object, when I look at this, what I see are words printed all over it in the design, and the warning on the side, and the message on the back. And I start to wonder, is there more meaning on this simple object than appears at first glance? What if somebody took every word off this bottle and rearranged them? Could it reveal more meaning about beer and bars, people who drink beer a lot? That's what I did. I took every word off this. It's the first poem in your program tonight. It's every word off of this bottle in a different order. If you haven't read it, you don't have to read it now. Read it after the show and think of me in a bar, <laughs> alone uncomfortable, insecure, completely lost in my mind. Which raises the question, why? Why would a guy sit down with a napkin and a pen, a bottle of beer, and write rolling, rolling, enjoyment, taste, beer? The answer lies in the second meaning of the word if. 
if meaning although possibly, even though. Okay? Sample sentence. She was an enchanting, if toothless woman. <laughs> or in my case, I spend a lot of time doing time consuming, if completely unproductive things. By the time I got to college, I wasn't doing puzzle books anymore. I was becoming a man, an adult. I had evolved. No more puzzle books. Now I was making the puzzles. I went to the school paper and I said, hey, I want to do a crossword puzzle for you guys, but I feel like I've seen the flat thing done before. I wanted more of a challenge. What about a three-dimensional crossword puzzle? Like this. <laughs> you see, this goes across, down, and back. That's three ways to say, I'm lonely. <laughs> I made five of these when I was in college. I spent more time on these puzzles than any class. There is no use for these puzzles. I don't even know if there was a use when I made them. And then when I was in class, I still had trouble paying attention. Same problem as grade school. But now, I found a sick way to up the ante. I found a way to give myself puzzles to solve by the end of class. Like this one, it's nine variable substitution. You see, I am not a dork. If I can find a number for every letter so that this mathematically works, by the end of class, I win. <laughs> and here's the solution. <laughs> A equals 5, M equals 2, K equals... And sometimes a simultaneous equation becomes true with the same numbers. I am not a dork, I am a nerd. <laughs> I wanted to improve my vocabulary. Look, I was at college, I thought, yes, improve. Continue to become better. Expand your vocabulary. If you want to do that, Maybe you read some books, hang out with English teachers, become friends with a poet. I said, no, no, no. Let's take out the middleman. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm going to read the dictionary all the way through, starting at the beginning like a book, in the A's. And every time I come to a word I don't know, highlight the word. Then in groups of 10, I put them in this notebook. You see, so I could quiz myself, 10 at a time, walking around. I'm in the I's here. I'm in the 450s, invective, jangle, jape, intromit, walking around, quizzing myself. When someone does this, you might call them abecedarian. <laughs> More likely, you're going to call them asshole. <laughs> but for me, this all sprang from a growing need to feel validated in the way I did from a puzzle book as a kid. It was a way of feeling like, yes, I'm getting better. I'm succeeding in small increments. But now, it moved off the page of the puzzle book and into the world at large, just little challenges. That's what it became, daily challenges, not big ones. I'm not the guy who climbs Mount Everest, you know? No, thank you. I'm the guy who spent two months last year learning how to write with his left hand, forcing himself to write with his left hand. So then I'm in a situation, I'm like, yeah, cool. You haven't broken your right hand, but you know what? It's good to have it. Yeah, right both ways. <laughs> I end up at the bank, say. There's a cute teller filling out my deposit slip. We flirt a little bit, slide it under the glass, and she's like, this guy's retarded. <laughs> but I'm thinking, ambidextrous genius. Yes, you'll have it. <laughs> if I'm on the street and someone stops me for directions, I give them directions. But I try to do it without using my hands. Because it's hard. It's a challenge. Where's the mall? Then I look sneaky. It's over there. Just go. I don't do this one so much anymore, but there was a time where if I had to pee, if I had to go to the bathroom, I would hold it in. I'd say, OK, it's a systemic challenge. Your body's telling you, urinate. And I'm saying, no, mind over body. I don't have to pee. I'm going to hold it in. One time, I failed that challenge. The challenge then became, how do I explain to my boss the wet spot in the front of my pants without giving myself away? And I think I pulled it off because I went, man, these are some sweaty balls. <laughs> when you do this over time, daily self-imposed hurdles every day, you develop what I call a number of useless talents. Useless talents.
Jesus. Why? 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 Useless dance. Why? Why spend so much time doing these things? Clean your room. Take a shower. Why? Useless talent. Useless talent. A unicycle. When did I become that guy? <laughs> College, sophomore year, second semester. When I joined the Anti-Gravity Society. <laughs> you don't want to be the unicycle guy, trust me. I did my show in New York, my first run. I'd bring my unicycle to the theater every night. And this is how people on the train would look at me. <laughs> but in college, I'm riding around campus thinking, I'm the only guy on a unicycle. When I should have been thinking, I'm the only guy on a unicycle. <laughs> but I thought, yes, you're different, you're special. Yes, you've bruised your balls a few times, but you're different. <laughs> Now I'm older, look, I'm, I'm a little wiser. I'm still obsessed with challenges, I can't change that. But they're more creative. Painting, music, sewing. <laughs> I made these for the show and I think the ass is crooked, am I right? <laughs> it's okay. Most recently, I took up photography. I feel like, you know, it provides a literal lens. And I'm not saying I'm a great photographer, but I feel like I have potential. And I want to show you guys some photos I took. This is what I'm talking about. I call this society over there. <laughs> Men and women, what's the hurry in that direction? This is a fruit stand devoid of color. I say to the viewer, figure out what kind of fruit it is based on the shape, mofo. <laughs> this is a portrait of a pig much later. <laughs> I was at a party, there was a guy offering people milk duds. This candy back home that's popular. Out of nowhere, unsolicited. Hey man, you want a dud? You want a dud? I was like, whoa, where's my camera? Photo op, bam, look at that. Frame nicely, foot and everything. <laughs> Most people, if they even shoot a balance beam, are gonna go this way. Well, I took this sucker long ways. We call that perspective in the biz. <laughs> I was in an army store, army supply store. I wanted to buy some army boots, some GI boots. I found that they were too big for my feet. And I thought, hmm, symbolism. Me in the military, not a good fit. One-handed photo right there, bam. This is a bicycle with a sombrero on it. I think this speaks for itself. <laughs> I was, sometimes I set my camera up on a tripod and capture myself one moment in the day. Unexpected. This was 10 in the morning after kind of a rough night. I had some Tylenol, you know, I had a headache. But look, there's a Manet on the wall. I like his work. And I just thought it was framed nicely, kind of during my Jesus phase. It's like a trinity of being hungover. And then I was walking by this bus stop in the village, and I saw, look at this, a black guy, a Hawaiian guy, a South American girl, and a Hasidic Jew all waiting for the same bus. I was like, oh my god, that's like a melting pot bus scenario. <laughs> Capture that. So I did. It's funny, though, when I, I was looking at the pictures, I developed my film, and I noticed a weird coincidence I discovered between all the photos, which was each picture could be described with a palindrome. You know, a word or a phrase, it's the same forward and backwards. If we go back, I'll show you what I mean. First one, the man and the woman, I realize it's actually a picture of sexes, S-E-X-E-S. -E -E it's the same front and back. In the fruit stand, I noticed no lemon, no melon. Mmm, <laughs> a ham. Mmm. <laughs> Dude, 
dud. If you fall, stuns nuts. Fellas. I found that the GI boot's too big for my feet. El cycle. 10 a.m. Lonely, Tylenol, Mane. <laughs> Yo, aloha, hola, oi! <laughs> I'm not a photographer. <laughs> I'm a guy who's obsessed with palindromes. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here's one of my notebooks. One ride on the subway yielded this in one of my notebooks. This is me working it out. Yeah, you see, I'm figuring them out. When I come up with a good one, I put a box around it so I can use the palindrome later for something. Red nuts at fist under. That's a keeper. <laughs> wow, one man's tit. Oh, got its name now. Ow. <laughs> Shakespeare for the retarded? I don't know what that is. Tony H., why not? OK, what does this lead to? All this work. The crown jewel in my kingdom of useless talents. A 224-word palindrome. The whole thing is the same forward and backwards by letter. It's the second poem in your program tonight. About an alcoholic mailman, kind of. Right in the middle. If I, the show itself, a tiny palindrome. In the middle of the big palindrome. In the middle of the show. All woven together. And it doesn't make me any cooler. <laughs> it makes me a guy who spent a lot of time doing something wildly unproductive. Which brings me to the third meaning of the word if. If, meaning whether. OK, sample sentence. The small, hairy man wondered if it was wise to wear the tank top. In my case, I started to wonder if I couldn't deconstruct anything with a little bit of analysis. The satisfaction I was getting as a kid from puzzle books, from someone else's problems, and then from my own little puzzles. Did I need that, the challenges and everything? Couldn't I just derive the game or the puzzle from things just by looking at simple things and finding it within? And then things started to emerge, like swimming. For example, swimming, to me, that's a confusing sport. Because sometimes you do it for fun. But then other times, you do it to not die. <laughs> and when I'm swimming, sometimes I don't know which one it is. <laughs> I got to go by the outfit. Trousers, uh-oh. <laughs> Bathing suit, OK. Naked, we'll see. <laughs> I think about drowning. I think drowning would be a horrible experience. But I bet a little less horrible if right before that, you're really thirsty. <laughs> Because then you're like, man, I could use a drink. Oh, that's good. Whoa, too much. <laughs> that's why when I swim, I always bring pretzels. <laughs> I think the worst time to have a heart attack is during a game of charades. <laughs> Especially if your teammates are bad guessers. <laughs> I was at a party. I saw a guy wearing a leather jacket. And I thought, that is cool. Ten minutes later, I saw a guy wearing a leather vest. I thought, that is not cool. And that's when I realized that cool is all about leather sleeves. <laughs> I like fruit baskets. A fruit basket enables you to mail somebody fruit without appearing insane. If you just mail somebody some apples, they're like, what the hell is this? But if you put those apples in a basket, they're like, this is nice. <laughs> I keep a lighter on me at all times, you know, in my back pocket. I'm not a smoker. I just really like certain songs. <laughs> I believe that you can learn something in every situation. For example, this summer I, I was at a party, and I learned that there's a small but important difference between peeing in the pool and peeing into the pool. <laughs> location, location, location. <laughs> I don't like thank you cards because I don't know what else to say. What do I put on the inside? Man, <laughs> see front. I use this product called I Can't Believe It's Not Butter. Because sometimes when I'm having toast, I like to be incredulous. <laughs> How was breakfast? Unbelievable. <laughs> I grew up near the beach, and uh, I, like to, I like the beach. I like to get there really early before everybody else shows up. And I take like 30 bottles with notes in them and throw them into the water. And then I wait for everyone to come to the beach. When someone goes to pick up one of the bottles, I go up behind them. 
Because when they open it, inside there's a note that says, I'm standing right behind you. <laughs> You see, to me, this was a self-contained enjoyment, little games that I was just finding every day, walking around the street, you know, just in a store, sitting on a train. Things just started to pop up. But something strange was happening at the same time, kind of a parallel development. You see, I, I was on my course, achieve, achieve, goal, one after the other, to law school from 11 years old. And so I get there, first year of law school in New York. I arrive, and surprise, one week in, I hate it. It sucks. You have to understand, this was the plan. I'm the guy who's 12 years old, and people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I say, I don't know, either litigation or corporate mergers, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> what a prick. <laughs> but then I get there, and it's, no, it's no good. Socratic method, that's what we have in American law schools. Socratic method, you come into class the first day of the semester, pick a seat. Surprise, that's your seat for the year. The professor has a seating chart, and you can just put your name in there and look down and say, Mr. Martin. State the facts in the case Bowers v. Hardwick and just calls on you. Such a power play. I said, this, this is not for me. What am I going to do? I've got to put this into terms I can understand and make it a game. And that's when word of the day started at my law school. Word of the day was, if you get called on, you have to use the word of the day in your answer in class. And I will give you the word of the day before class, right outside. So now, there's 110 of us in the class <laughs> and one professor. And there are 110 people waiting to hear the word bagel. <laughs> and one guy who has no clue. So game on. One of the first words was arouse. Gave it to the class. My friend gets called on. Yeah, I believe that issue first arouse. <laughs> Excuse me, arose in the case. Yeah, nice going, Jason. Everyone's kind of looking around like impressive. Hobble. This law was designed to prevent people from hobbling into court with any old claim. Good job, Rob. Now I'm doing the reading. I'm becoming a good student for all the wrong reasons, just so I can show off, so that I can prove I can use the word cupcake in a contracts case. <laughs> Changed the whole dynamic. And so the game went on. But you know what, like any game, people learned it, it got too easy. So I had to up the ante after a few weeks to a harder word, sassy. That's a hard one to use in a legal context. We had five classes a day. No one could use sassy through the first four classes. Then the last class, criminal law. We're doing battered wife syndrome of all things. Our friend Louise gets called on. She gives a real answer. And then she says, I just want to add that I think it's wrong that some men hit their wives just because they're being sassy. And an S sound came over the whole room. Because everyone turned to their neighbor and went, sassy. And I was a god. Well, <laughs> I wasn't a god. I was a guy who was, I was becoming the crazy guy at law school. I was never the crazy guy in grade school or high school, college, pretty normal. But now, I think it was a bad fit. I was out of my skin. I was becoming somebody I didn't recognize. I was, I was crazy Dimitri. You know that guy who starved for attention? Every situation becomes about him trying to be funny. That's what I was doing. For example, I was in this one class called Criminal Procedure. It was an evening course. It was worse than the first year courses because in that class you were on call. It wasn't the whole class getting called on. It was just five people at a time. Every class session, just five people got called on. So they tell you the day before, you five, you're on call tomorrow. So do the reading. Make sure you're here because you're going to get every question. Oh, man. So I went out to dinner with my friends before class. We went to a Chinese food restaurant. And crazy Dimitri decides to strike. I go to my friend, hey, man, see that fortune cookie you're holding? Open it up. Whatever it says inside, I'm saying is my answer in class. <laughs> He's like, all right, man. If you do that, I'll get up and say, I agree with Dimitri. <laughs> all right, don't dare me, because you're going to get burnt. So we go to class. There's like seven of us that know about it. And we're gated. We're like, he's going to read a fortune cookie, man. It's crazy. This guy's crazy. Do it, man. Yeah. So the moment comes, the professor calls on me. I think it was like a Fourth Amendment case or something. And I just, it's my chance. I look forward and I just bail. I don't do it. I felt like it was disrespectful or something. I don't know. I just, I crushed and I just gave a real answer. My friend, you know, kind of gave me a glance like, stupid. I knew it. You wouldn't do it. It's like, I felt defeated. Then the professor asks another question. And he ends it with, Dimitri again. I'm like, 
wait a minute, second chance here. You gotta go for it, you gotta take it, do it, man. So I just look forward, clear my throat, I just go, when love and skill are combined, expect a masterpiece. <laughs> Six guys go crazy. A hundred other people look at me like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and this is how lost I got, this is how crazy. The professor didn't say, Dimitri again. He said, Denise McGinn. <laughs> that was the next name on the list. It was alphabetical of the on-call. But in my head, I'm hearing, Dimitri again, now's your chance, go for it. This poor girl gets called on, pressure situation. Some schmuck on the other side of the room yelling out, combine love and skill, Denise. <laughs> I got lost in my own little world of crazy Dimitri. You see, it's funny. Sort of is a harmless thing to say. Sort of. It doesn't really mean anything. It's a filler, you know what I mean? But after certain things, sort of means everything. Like after, I love you. <laughs> or, you're going to live. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is I went to law school. Sort of. <laughs> you see, I made it through two years of law school. I made it through two of the three years. The hardest parts the first year, done. Second year, I hung in there. But then, couldn't do it. After two, I said, I'm out of here. And it was a crazy moment to have a plan from 11 years old and just kind of every choice, every summer, classes, extra activities, SATs, essays, leading to that one big goal, and then being that close to it and realizing, I made a huge mistake. I have to admit it, cut my losses, I'm out of here. And it was a total crisis, a total crisis of relevance, because I was now an adult. Yes, okay, it's cool to be quirky, maybe, on the side, do some puzzles, make puzzles, whatever. You learn how to ride a unicycle. That's cool when it's like on the side, right? And you have a plan. What happens when you remove the plan? What you're left with is a guy who likes to do anagrams and doesn't have a job. Sweet, that's a catch. <laughs> that brings me to the fourth meaning of the word if. If, used to introduce an exclamatory clause indicating a wish. You know what, no sample sentence here. If I could just figure out my life. That's the point I'm getting to. That was the big question. That's what it all turned on. If I could just figure out my life. I realized I don't want to be some guy who, who has no purpose, no application. I mean, what am I going to be as an older guy? Creepy Uncle Dimitri who's like, come here, I'll show you a coin trick, yeah. <laughs> Is that my achievement? That I can like do something with a yo-yo? Oh no, uh-uh. And so I turn my analysis away from extraneous things, from irrelevance to time. I said, okay, I'm wasting a lot of this. I seem to have trouble managing it. Can I harness it? Can I use it better? And maybe will that lead me to being a more productive person? And this is when I had a breakthrough slash Break down? <laughs> See, I found a way to make myself the puzzle. Finally, I became the puzzle to solve. A point system. I turned myself into a weekly point system. Seven categories. Five points in each category. To be tallied every Sunday night. 35 points, maximum possible, Dimitri week situation. <laughs> in an effort to get better. See, here's some of the categories. Body. Subcategories, diet and fitness slash care. Okay, if I eat three fruits and two vegetables every day of the week for seven days, I get a point at the end of the week. That means you ate better. Worked out for three days. If I did a leg workout, if I did crunches, whatever FB5 was, <laughs> and floss five days a week, I get a point for that. It's a bitchy one, but I get a point at the end of the week. And even fancy stuff, I get variable here. I can run as many miles as I choose at the beginning of the week. I chose 10 this week. I ran zero. That's a zero point body week. Not very good. Mind. Okay, I did a little better in this category this week. Read two books. Do 30 minutes of puzzles. Brainstorm for an hour. So that's like, okay, think about something. Starting now and go. Cool, done, awesome, you got a point. Use lateral thinking for three hours? How do I do that? Hey, man, could you tie me to this chair? And if I can get out in less than, you know, like about three hours, it'd be great. I'd get a point for it. Thanks. <laughs> Wanted to be more creative. So I was like, all right, two drawings, paintings, or sculptures. That's good. It's a grab bag. Yeah, that equals you're a creative person. 
Next category. Contribution. Okay, cool. It's not all about me. I found a spot for the rest of the world in my point system. One little corner. <laughs> I broke the world into people I know, family and friends, and others. Help someone solve a problem. Do something for another person. If I help a stranger in some way, uplift another person, or try to see another's point of view, maybe I can combine those three into like a triple score. You know, pick up a strange baby and be like, what are you thinking? <laughs> Bam, three points right there. Relationship, gave, shared. Nice subcategories. Did something for Jen. I was with Jen at the time. That makes sense. <laughs> Here's my expression or equation for how you have a successful relationship with a woman. If during the week you talk less than she does, <laughs> that means you were listening. <laughs> See, that week she talked more than me, so it was good. I was a listener. I was getting the relationship stronger. Did my share. See, even here, went on a romantic date, had two dinners together. I was trying to keep the relationship strong in a way that I could tally. Vision slash ethics, the most embarrassing category. Internal and external. Visualize slash focus for more than a half hour during the course of the week. Cool, centered, you know, like a yogi or something. It's great. What about this? Reflected and rededicated self. That's my favorite one of the whole thing. That's me giving myself a point for filling out the point system. <laughs> Guaranteed one point week every week. I just open it up. I'm like, yes. You're reflecting and rededicating yourself right now. It's great. And then even here, demonstrated moral courage. How do you do that? I got to find someone being persecuted, make the right moral choice, step in, be courageous, and then have my paper and, and record it all in one move. It's hard. Conveyed unassailable confidence, all this stuff. It's like kind of embarrassing. You know, I used to look at my feet a lot at that time, so I was trying to be more forthright, proactive, confident. So I was like, yes, unassailable. That's the kind of confidence I want. Great vocabulary word. Thanks, notebook. <laughs> Here's where it gets interesting. I did this system for 27 weeks in a row. I'm on week 18 here. I'm already on version 10 of the point system. You see, if I wasn't getting enough points, the problem was not with me. <laughs> it's the system. Fix it. And towards the end, wow. Boxes with little boxes in them. It's all justified. I did this in Word. This is very difficult. <laughs> I did an analysis of the analysis of myself. I found that over 27 weeks, I averaged 11.2 points out of 35. That's 32%. That sucks. <laughs> I failed. I failed miserably. That's half an F. That is horrible. My worst week was four points. Four points? What the hell was I doing? <laughs> Help an old lady. Eat a banana, for Christ's sake. I got one point for filling out the chart. <laughs> Highest week, 24 points. OK. You know what? I thought that would be my lowest week, like mid-20s. I was figuring, yeah, you'll be high functioning up near the 30s, maybe max out at 35 a few times, and then, you know, just up all the goals. Self-actualize. Great. Yeah, do it up. <laughs> Worst category score was management. Management? I'm the manager. <laughs> I created the whole world. I got 18% in the managed world that I created. Best category score, relationship. All right, 62%. That's more than three out of five every week for 27 weeks, for half a year. Footnote, Jen and I got married. Footnote two, Jen and I got divorced. <laughs> but that's a different show. That's a longer, more complicated show, and the, uh, the charts <laughs> are really different um, and skewed. What, what do I learn from all this? What can I conclude from all this analysis? I have no fucking clue. <laughs> I spent a half a year of my life doing this every week. I don't know. I honestly don't know. You know, I look back on it and I realize my intentions were good. I was trying to become a better person. I was trying to methodically record what a better person would be for someone like me and what I could do every day, capturing every moment, trying to move towards that. But I failed pretty miserably. <laughs> Now I look back, and with a little bit of distance, I wonder, what was I going for? Like, who did I think I was going to become? What would the 35-point week have been like?
I lost sight. I was so busy trying to figure out who I wanted to be, I didn't realize who I was actually becoming. I would walk around with the point system in my pocket all the time, just tallying whatever I could get, thinking I was figuring out my life. Yeah, I could ride a unicycle, I could do puzzles, whatever, blah, 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 I tallied myself. But look, at the same time, I was a dropout from school, divorced already. My job, proofreader at law firms from midnight to 8 a.m. in the morning. That was my that was the career that I had carved out for myself. I couldn't just figure out my life, that became clear. That brings me to the final meaning of the word if. Where we started in the first place, a possibility, condition, or stipulation. Sample sentence. There will be no ifs, ands, or buts. You're going to fat camp. <laughs> or in my case, I believe that every if is a possibility. But more importantly, it's an opportunity. A chance to make a choice. Those choices determine the I. I think about some of the past ifs that led up to this moment tonight, this if, and if I had chosen differently with some of those past ifs, how would this moment in time right now be different? For example, if I wasn't on the math team when I was in high school, well, in central New Jersey, I would have been considered cooler, I would have hung out more, would have gone out with a girl named Gina maybe with really big hair, we had a Camaro, Dimitri and Gina and script on the window, smoke some pot, listen to Zeppelin, hang out a bunch. One thing leads to the next right now, employee of the month at my family's diner. <laughs> and I say things like, dude, and whatever a lot more. And sentences like, dude, whatever. <laughs> what if I paid attention in class? No puzzle books, no games, just focus. I would have been a better student. You know what, I would have finished law school. I had one year left, I would have finished. I'd be married right now to a doctor. We'd have a cool car, come a stereo, maybe a couple kids, a nice house. Society would respect us. And right now, funny guy at the law firm. <laughs> and the stage, my stage would be the water cooler. I'd be the guy who stands there and is like, do you have a good weekend, fag? Hey, pull my finger. Oh, he's crazy, man. <laughs> he's got a tie with clowns on it. That guy should do stand-up. 
Okay, what if I focus? No useless talents. Practice one sport instead of all the useless talents. Maybe I could get really good at that sport. Maybe I get great at it. Self-esteem goes up, I do better with the women. Travel, I could become an international sports star. <laughs> Traveling the world, signing, uh, paddles, having all kinds of headbands, I don't even know. It's a dream life. Okay, I'm not an athlete, fine, maybe I'm not an athlete. I'm a nerd, okay, I accept it. How about I apply that? Focus, develop some clarity. Contribute something to the world. Don't be so self-centered with the games and the puzzles. Maybe I could, maybe I could change the world. Okay, maybe I'm getting carried away. But I think I did figure something out. I equals all of the ifs added up over time. The ifs, those are the possibilities. That's infinite for all of us. Every day, there are just millions of them. Time, that's finite for each of us. No question there. Maybe if you divide the choices by the amount of time you have, the real I can emerge, depending upon those choices. So in the end, all I can say is, you can't figure out a person, definitely not yourself. You can't maximize a life. What you can do is try to be honest in the choices that you make. Be true to yourself, no matter how embarrassing those choices are. Life is not a science, I realize that. But if I told you that right now, I don't have a point system of some kind, I'd be a liar. <laughs> Look, I'm a guy who does palindromes, tell jokes about leather jackets, because that gives me some meaning, at least for now. You know what, I apologize for none of it. Because the unexamined life is not worth living, man. <laughs> <laughs>